Let's hear together this morning uh, God's word to us, remembering that these are not man's words, but these are God's that he is giving to us. So let's hear this morning. Uh, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word to us today. May we have the ears to hear. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come before your word. May we be humbled by your word. May we sit under your word today in such a way that we are changed by it, that we would be encouraged by it, challenged where we need to be challenged. And in all things, Lord, we pray it leads to further obedience of you, but further love of you through studying your word. We're grateful this morning that we are not left to our own devices as human beings, that we are not left to man's wisdom for living this life and knowing you. But this morning, Lord, we are reminded by coming to your word that you give us revelation of who you are. You give us revelation of what this world is all about, the problem of evil, uh, the goodness that you have given to us in this world, but the problem of sin in this world. And so, Father, may we know you through your word this morning. May you be at work by your spirit in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if I was to ask you a question this morning, like if you were sitting next to somebody one day and talking through the book of Romans, would you be able to give a summary of the last couple of chapters that we've been through? Your first thought might be, oh, I don't think I could do such a thing. Well, I've seen you week after week, Bible out in front of you study notes, uh, glasses on, and, and, and into the Word, and I think you'd be surprised at how much you would actually be able to recall and tell with a little bit of um, going over what we've been through. Where you might have missed a sermon or two, uh, we've got them online on, on our YouTube page. You can fill in the gaps of, of getting deeper into those texts. But what I want to do for a moment is just take you back to Romans chapter 3, because we have been on a journey looking at justification by faith. And this started, what we're finishing today is this journey of looking at justification by faith. But this has been going since Romans chapter 3. So can you come back with me to Romans chapter 3 verse 21. And uh, this is where Paul brings in the teaching of justification by faith. Why did Paul need to bring in this teaching? Because he's just told us for about two chapters the problem of sin. That all people have a sin problem. It's not only a few people in the world, but everybody has rebelled against God's good ways. And we land upon this, uh, such an important part of Romans, in chapter 3, verse 21. And it says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believed. For there is no distinction. And here he's, he now summarizes this journey of understanding sin. And he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So after journeying through and saying, look, it doesn't matter if you're a Jewish person. It doesn't matter if you did your best at keeping the law. It doesn't matter if you've been working really hard to to, to be righteous in the sight of God. It doesn't matter if you're culturally a a Jew or you're circumcised. And it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile and you've never had any Jewish culture whatsoever. It doesn't matter who you are. We are all guilty before God because of our sin. We've all sinned. We all fall short. But then this is where the turning point comes into the book of Romans. This is where we go from the deep knowledge and understanding of the sin problem to then experiencing and understanding what Jesus has done for us at the cross, which is people are, verse 24, justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This is where justification by faith entered into the conversation. And what this means is, justification is about right standing with God. 
Knowing, yes, that we are guilty. Knowing, yes, that we have fallen short. How do we then get in right standing with God? We can only believe upon the Lord Jesus. We can only receive this as a gift. And of course, this creates in us a response to God. We repent of our sins and we turn towards Jesus and trust him and continue to follow him. But it is a gift that we have received. Regardless of the sin of our past, regardless of the sin of today, you can be justified in right standing with God by believing on Jesus' death and resurrection for sin. This is the good news, isn't it? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ that we proclaim to the world that so desperately needs to hear about his grace. Now, Paul, this is what's so good about this whole section in, in Romans, is Paul just doesn't give us one little verse to talk about justification. He then goes on right into chapter 5, backing up his position and his argument for justification by faith. Not by your works, not by your ability to be in right standing with God, but by faith in the Lord Jesus. And as we look at, if you just glance over of chapter 4, you'll see that Abraham was called in. And it's like if you were uh, in, a, in a court and you were calling in some witnesses to, to back up your position here, to give evidence for Abraham is called in. And even though Abraham is considered the, the great man of faith, the father of faith, Abraham, even he was justified not by his doing, but by his faith. Um, not just Abraham is brought in, but David is brought in also. Verse 7, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Isn't that so true? How blessed are we that our breaking of God's laws are actually forgiven? Whose sins are covered? Who wants their sins covered? Amen. <laughs> blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So when our, our Lord looks at us now, he sees the righteousness of Christ. If we have repented and come to him, that's the way God now views us. He sees us with the righteousness of of his son and we received it as a gift. He continues on then with this presentation of justification by faith and then we landed at chapter 5 and then he delved into, he didn't depart from justification, he kept building on this position by saying how good justification by faith is by then saying, telling us all the benefits that come from justification. That we have peace with God. We have daily access to an abundance of grace in him. Uh, it moved into the section of talking about how even our suffering that we go through, even the trials and the afflictions that we have in life are used by God to produce in us character, endurance, patience. Um, our hearts are filled with the love of God through the Holy Spirit. So it's not just that we're now in right standing with God. The benefits continue on and on and on in the life that we live. It's not just simply that I, oh, thank goodness I've got myself into, uh, I've landed into a place of being saved and now I'm waiting for heaven. No, the, the goodness keeps going. The good news of Jesus doesn't stop just there. It keeps going. There's more good news for us each day. Um, Paul has then gone into this comparison of digging a bit deeper into the origin of sin, uh, to, to, to see that even right from the very beginning, Adam sinned and we are in Adam. Unless we are saved, then we are in Christ. We are in Adam in that Adam's sin has impacted every single human being. He, he operates as a, as a headship for humanity. And if we think about that as, as Adam being ahead, we also then think about Christ being ahead. That he has replaced that. He is the second Adam, the, the better Adam that has come. And it takes us to the conversation of the origin of sin and the deeper understanding of where this all came from in the first place. And then as we land here this morning on these final verses, Paul brings this home and this conclusion of the amazing uh, goodness of justification by faith, still making this comparison of death that comes through Adam, but life that comes through Christ. And here he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What's he saying? He's talking about Adam here. One act of Adam 
One act of disobedience, what did it do? It brings death. That one act of trespass led to condemnation. That's hell. That's judgment because of this sin that is committed. But as this turns and we understand Christ, we, we know that one act of righteousness, Christ's obedience, Adam's disobedience now compared with Christ's obedience brings justification and life for all men. Isn't this good news to us? Over the last two weeks, we've been doing this comparison. Adam, sin, Christ's righteousness. Adam's disobedience, Christ's obedience. Um, with Adam as our representative, compared to when we have Christ and we are represented by him. Paul restates here that the one trespass, the work of Adam, brought judgment, but the one act of Christ brings life. I think it's worthwhile this morning that we look upon these words, all men. See how one act brings uh, condemnation to all men, but then also in Christ, righteousness and life for all men, for those who are in Christ. Um, this is one of those times where knowing some of the original language of the Greek language that the New Testament was written in is very beneficial to us. Uh, when we look at the word for uh, the, 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 for this phrase, all men, we find in the Greek the word anthropos. And this word gets used for both, meaning directly to men, to males, but it is also used generally referring to human beings, male or female. Do you come up with a question here, though, when you're looking at this phrase here, all men? Um, that brings out a question for you. What, is, what does Paul mean when he says that justification is for all men. Because of what Jesus has done, does this raise up a question for you? And it does for many people as they look upon this phrase. If Paul's wording here is that Jesus, what Jesus did brings life to all men, what do you think some people might try and do with that phrase? Have you ever heard of universalism? Universalism is where people believe that everybody is saved. Because of what Jesus did, we're all going to heaven. There's no such thing as hell. Everybody is going to be okay. And the, the, this is a passage that can be used in this way because if Adam's sin affected all men, meaning every single person on the planet, and then in the same passage, Paul's using all men, um, isn't he just saying the same thing? Because now Jesus has come, everybody is saved. We have a teaching moment here in Scripture about not isolating the text. We have a teaching moment here about not just zooming in upon one scripture and saying this is what I want it to mean. Now here's the thing that we that I find helpful. When it comes to reading and studying our Bibles there's times like now that we zoom in upon one verse. We look upon it, we study it to understand what it means. But we also need to zoom out which means that we consider what all of the Bible has to teach about that topic. And if we did the zooming in, we would land in very, very different places all the time in our understanding. So we zoom in, and it seems to say that Paul is saying that all men um, are justified. But when we zoom out and we look at all of the passages con concerning salvation, justification, we understand very, very clearly that salvation is only for those who are in Christ. Salvation is only for those who have repented of their sin and believed upon the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 16. The question is asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is a genuine question. What must I do to be right with God? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Indicating that there is a time when he was not saved and belief in Jesus was necessary. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says, whoever does, not believe will be, whoever does not believe will be condemned. That doesn't sound like salvation for all people on the planet. If you do not believe in Christ, condemnation is the path. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We see clearly that there are going to be people who say, Lord, Lord, and they will not be a part of the all men that Paul is talking about here. So therefore, we can know abundantly clear 
we don't have to guess about what Paul is doing here. When he talks about all men, he is talking about all men, all humans, all people who are in Christ. All of those who are in Christ will be justified. All who are in him. Not all people, but those who are Christ's. So unless one repents, unless they understand of what Jesus has done at the cross, they will be condemned and not justified. So, uh, turning now to verse 19, if you'll re return to the text with me. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Let me read that one more time. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. I think a, a standout for us here is these wor the words, the many were made sinners. That's a difficult phrase. It's not difficult in the sense of difficult to understand, but I believe it's difficult for humans to accept. Um, I've been saying that we're all impacted by Adam's sin, talking of Adam as a representative for all people, a head figure. Theologians often refer to this as the, the federal headship of Adam, comparing that with Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 again, in Adam, as opposed to being in Christ, uh, in the same way that Adam is a representative, so is Christ for all who are in him. But there's two things to mention here, I think. First, when I sin, my response is never, look what Adam has done to me again. That's not how it works, is it? When I, when I sin, I know that I sinned. And I'm not blame shifting and looking to pin it on Adam. Uh, we understand this very clearly already because did not Paul already make the case that we are all sinners? That we have all gone astray? We've all fallen short? We are all responsible for our own sin? So we are all without excuse. But if we are investigating this whole sin issue at a deeper level, which is what Paul is doing, we discover the origin of the sin issue, which is that it is with Adam. His sin that spread to all human beings. His sin. His sin. We, are not, we are not disconnected from Adam's sin. Adam's sin... And the death issue has been imputed to us. It's, been, it's come over to us. We've received it from Adam, this problem that we have. Now, understanding this, there might be some objections. And you might have even come to them at the last couple of weeks. You might have even been thinking through this a little bit yourself. The charge comes against God saying, that's not fair. That's not fair, God. I should be born free pure, able to make my own decisions right from the beginning without any influence of any other human being. That's not fair, this, this sin of Adam where I've been made a sinner because of Adam's sin. I don't deserve that, someone might say, or they might say, I don't want anybody representing me, thank you very much. I don't want to have inherited a sin issue. Now, some responses to that. I'm not saying that we can never consider those types of objections uh, we are human beings looking at the world from a human perspective. We only have, as we come into this life, our human experience to, to go off. Um, but as we grow in the Bible, as we grow in Christ, there is a shift that actually takes place in us that actually deals with charges against God of saying things that he has done are not fair. See, what happens is human beings without God's input without the humbling of human hearts, human beings, by nature, have a very, very high view of humanity. Do you know what I mean by that? We, we value and view humans as being really, really actually quite good and, and great. We think of ourselves, we justify us. And if you don't believe me on that, think about the last time somebody accused you of something and you went straight into the defensive mode. You went into that place where you were like, no, nope, I'm actually really good. I never would have done such a thing. That's what we do. Human beings value their own humanity and have a high view of humans. And if we're honest, we have a low view of God. And if you want to look at that further, just look at all the objections in the world to God. It shows you very, very clearly what humans think of God. 
Um, we, we uplift humanity. And this is one of the big problems we have in our world right now in regards to how do we fix the world. Because human beings are looking at humans to fix the world. They believe if you can, come on guys, just love each other and the world will be a better place. We've been trying that for a really long time, haven't we? <laughs> is it going well? No. No. <laughs> Holding humanity up. And this actually, and we've got to be careful, friends, because this is creeping into the church. It's called the social gospel. Rather than looking at Christ on the cross as the only hope for humanity, we go, no, we can do it ourselves. And we can't. When will we learn we cannot do it? It's this uh, inward looking that happens in humanity. We look within. And we're just fed this rubbish day after day. You've got what it takes. It's, it's all inside of you. Look in your heart. Have you heard that one? Follow your heart. Okay. So, humans. High view of humanity. Low view of God. So what we actually do is we then bring charges against God. We say things to him. That's not fair. And what we're actually doing is we're imposing human, human wisdom, human moral, morality upon the creator of the universe. That's what, that's what we're actually doing. We are taking the judge, uh, the, the seat, we've got the hammer in our hand, and we're saying, God, you get in the hot seat, and I'm going to dictate to you, God, what's fair, what's right in this world. We think God could learn a few things from, from us, don't we? Do we start to get a little bit of the understanding of the imbalance that humanity has with our that's not fair charges against God? We start to elevate ourselves and, and, and think that we are something that we are not. Now, I'm not, say, I'm not saying this to say that humans are so worthless. That's an extreme that we don't need to go to. Remember, God creates us with worth, with value. He formed you in your mother's womb. He loves you and values you so much he sent Christ for you. So we're not going to another extreme, right? We don't need to go there. But we are the creature. We are not the creator. He is the creator. We are the creature. We let God teach us. We don't teach God. So as we move forward in the charges of that's not fair, as we consider these things, yes, these can be some, some tough things to wrestle through. But as we look at it, there's something that really, really is important here. If we're going to get into a place of the whole that's not fair, then we need to be consistent. And if you don't want to have Adam represent you, then what are you going to do with Christ representing you? Are you going to take that on your own as well? Are you going to look to your own righteousness to be right with God? Or are you going to be happy over here saying, actually, no, I do like a represent thing. I am actually happy for Christ to step in and represent me with his righteousness. Do you see the issue? If we reject this headship idea of Adam, are we going to reject Christ? Because I'll tell you what's not fair. Not fair is a saviour who is sinless, who is perfect in every way, coming and dying for your sin. He didn't sin once. That's not fair. Yet he did it anyway. He stepped in place that you might be redeemed. So yes, wrestle through the questions. Consider these things biblically. But let us not get into a place of dictating fairness to God. Let us be humbled by the cross. Let our hearts be okay with him being God and us not being God. Christ came for our sins, not his own. Christ gave us, even though we didn't deserve it, forgiveness, grace, and an abundance of it. Return with me to the text, uh, chapter, uh, sorry, verse, verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's good news right there. The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul's already taught us that the purpose of the law, one of the purposes of the law, is to reveal to us our sin. When we look upon God's laws in the word, we, we see pretty quickly we've fallen short of them, right? But what does it mean that the law came in to increase the trespass? Um, what it means is that it, it's not saying that before Moses received the law at Mount Sinai, that there was only a few sins going on, we remember that God's law has always existed because God exists. Um, sin is actually lawlessness. 
And we know that sin has taken place from Adam. So the breaking of God's law has, has, been, has been taking place. But the difference is, when the law came in, that's a written, specific set of instructions. That is knowing and understanding even more clearly what it looks like to rebel against God. God gave us in our conscience knowledge of him. God has written the work of his law upon our hearts. So we're without excuse. We, we know right and wrong at a, at a very deep and foundational level. But having the words in front of you, having the law come in, we see sin so more clearly, don't we? We see it specifically. And it's just like when Adam was in the garden, he broke a very specific command from God. You can do all this, but you can't do that one thing. And he broke it. The sin was so evident, it was so clear. Uh, and likewise, with God's law coming in at Moses, the sin increased in the, in the sense that we see it, the clearness of the breaking of his laws. We are without excuse. Uh, when we're honest with ourselves, and, and we need to be when it comes to sin, we understand that we willfully disobey. We know as we do it, it's not the right thing to do. Um, it might be, as it's coming out of our mouth, we might even start with the phrase, this is not gossip, but... We might start off with a, almost like a qualifying that we know we're about to sin, but yet we give a, a statement at the beginning just to, to try and make out as if it's not sin. But we know when we break God's law, it is willfully sinning. And that's what Adam did. He willfully sinned against the specific commands of God. But here's the thing that happens for Christians as we consider the breaking of God's laws. If you are truly saved, if you are truly in Christ, you will actually hate it when you sin against God. You kick yourself after. I knew that was wrong and I went and did it anyway. Why haven't I learned the first 200 times? And you might be justified in saying, well, if they hadn't you know, done that thing or if I hadn't have been so in, that, in this situation, when the dust settles, when the emotion settles, we get to this place where we say, I hate my sin. And you will find yourself praying, Lord, change me. Help me to change. You might pray the psalm um, which says, Create in me a pure heart, Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. And you have this, this deep understanding, don't you? And it's, it's almost like you say, This sin is so foul in me. I hate it. You're with Paul saying, Who can free me from this body of death? How wretched am I? How do I get this sin out of me? But now look what God does in the text. As we consider sin and the, the, the clear knowing of our sin but where sin increased grace abounded all the more where sin increased and it was so visible it was so noticeable grace abounded all the more Christian look at that text look at your God look at the grace that he has for you in your sin this is one of those moments in the Bible where the word but is one of the most beautiful words. But we looked at that last week, didn't we? Where the, the sin leads to death. The, the wages of sin, the cost of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we've got another one today. The sin was so noticeable. The sin increased. It abounded. But where sin increased, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I hope that as you look upon that today, you're doing two things. And I think this is what, what we should be doing as Christians. We have a very, very clear and good understanding of how bad our sin is. But at the very same time that we are able to see what it is and understand it, we look to the grace of God. And in fact, we look to the grace of God more than we look at the sin. We know it, we understand it, but we look at that cross and we recognise what has been done for us. Because it doesn't just say that the grace kind of balances it out, does it? It doesn't just say that, okay, there's just enough grace to cover, don't, maybe don't do any more sins, it's just enough. No, no, the grace abounds all the more. 
The grace is greater in Christ than the trespass that is in Adam. Grace is greater. God's grace to his people outweighs the sin. Are you hearing that this morning? That's going to produce change in you. As you look at your sin and you know it's heavy and it's foul, it's disgusting. It is. That's what sin is. It is vile. It is the breaking of God's good and perfect ways. And it is foul. Yet at the same time as we understand what Jesus has done, this grace abounds and outweighs this sin. Sin has consequence. Make no mistake, it leads to death. But God's grace abounds and it leads to life, friends. That one is death. But the grace leads to life. God's grace abounds and the consequence for those who receive it through Christ is a positive consequence. It is a greater reward. It is life in Christ. So as we hate our sin, we realise the weight of it, the cost of it. But we look to Christ, don't we? And as we look to Christ, that is actually what is going to change you to sin less. Make no mistake, I'm not saying here this morning that carry on in your sins because God's just got so much grace for you. No, that's not biblical. Again, zooming in on the text, understand the grace, but zoom out. Be obedient. Put sin to death in your life. Absolutely. And you do it because you can see how gracious your God is. Think of a time where somebody did something for you in life that you didn't deserve. Maybe it was when you were a child and you knew you messed up, but parents were forgiving and loving to you. Or or whatever it could be with somebody, maybe a friend that you hurt, but they came back and they they gave you a gift or they just shared their their love for you and, and you just felt, how could I deserve this? This is what is going on here. You didn't go back to your friend and go, great, they forgave me. I'll go and I'll go and do it again a few more times. I'll step up the sin a little bit. Absolutely not. You'd start to change because of the grace that you have received. And so do we, as we experience this abundance of grace, we start to be transformed. And this is where chapter six is heading. When we come out of justification by faith, we are heading into a chapter that is talking about sin being put to death and and the the growth that comes in a Christian life in regards to living for our savior. So it's right for us this morning to have these two views. We can't be unbalanced. We can't be a church that hides sin, condemnation and judgment because those are biblical, those are real and God talks about it a lot, doesn't he? We can see from the journey of Romans already. Yet, we don't fall into a place of wallowing in sin as we receive the grace and look to the cross of Christ. Amen? Verse 21, we're bringing this home. So that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Read that one more time. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We've learnt already from Paul that sin reigned in death. Once sin came in, death spread to all people and death reigned because of sin. But now as we understand grace, we understand that grace reigns through righteousness. And where does this lead us as we understand this reigning of grace, this this abundance of grace that is given to us? These final words leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's been dealing with justification by faith. Being in right standing with God. He has told us all the benefits, the, the, the wonderful beauty of justification. But where does it all lead? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but there are times when I think about eternity and eternal life. And I'm so overwhelmed by it. Maybe it's because I've only ever known a world that's so full of brokenness and sin. That my mind at times has difficulty fathoming the reality of a world without sin, a world without evil. My my mind does struggle with that at times. And this is is important, I think, to, to just highlight here. When we talk about the words eternal life, we're not just saying life that never ends. 
Because to be honest with you, if, if I've just got the reality that I know and life that never ends, that sounds exhausting to me. It absolutely does. Eternal life isn't just the meaning of life that never ends. Eternal life means so much more. Eternal life comes with it some of the most amazing promises. And there is a lot of them that we could mention this morning. We could mention the fact that there will be an absence of sin. Amen? Amen. Are you so tired of your sin, let alone the sin of the world? Eternal life comes with the promise of no sin. Eternal life comes with the promise of the absence of evil and suffering. Does that sound good? But let us make no mistake here this morning. When we are talking about eternal life, we're not simply talking about these kind of benefits. Another one that people can have is the reality of losing a loved one that they knew were a Christian and longing to see them another, another time. Now, I don't want to minimise that reality and that hope for anybody here that is in that position, because that is, that is true, right? If somebody that we love was in Christ and they've died, they're in the presence of the Lord right now. And that is, that is really good news in, in regards to eternity. But not even that is the greatest thing about eternal life. The greatest prize that comes with eternal life is Christ himself. Your saviour who died on the tree, you will be with him for eternity. Think about this room now full of, full of Christians. Think about each other sitting in here, Christ having died for each one. And now think about each other being with Jesus. Is that beautiful? The reality, as I look at you right now and I think of you with Jesus, your saviour who died for you, that's what eternal life promises. That Christ will be with each of you. The psalmist says, Who have I in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail. However, the Lord is my portion forever. Jesus is the greatest prize, friends. The saviour that we long for. The saviour that we sing about every Sunday morning. The, the saviour that we preach about, it won't just be preaching about him and singing about him. You will be with him for all of eternity. Friends, I hope that you are just, just stirred up and filled with, with hope this morning as, you, as, as we come to this conclusion of justification by faith. I pray that you see your sin and you're not disregarding your sin. I pray that as we've talked about sin over and over again, you haven't been in a place going, yeah, that's those people, I'm actually pretty good. I really hope you haven't done that, because if you have done that, you, you're not saved yet. You haven't come to the place of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. So each of us has to come to that place. But I pray also that as you recognise your sin, you repent of it and you believe upon the Lord Jesus. So you don't wallow in your sin and you don't get to have the excuse that, oh, I'm just a sinner, so oh, too bad, that's just who I am. No, Jesus died for your sins that you might have new life in him, that you might be a new creation. And so you can't stay in that place. It doesn't mean you're not aware of it. You, you fight against it. You put it to death. But you are a new creation in Christ. And we need to, to live like we are a new creation in Christ, putting sin to death but being joyful in the grace that has been given to us. You are justified by your faith in Jesus. You are in right standing because of what Jesus did at the cross, not because anything that you could ever add to the mix. May we continue together to be transformed into the likeness of Christ because of this great news to us. The holiness of God and the, the problem of our sin, we've had to know that, but we know of the grace of God towards sinners, which each of us are. May we be transformed. Finally, friends, if you hear this today and you know you haven't come to the place of putting your faith in Jesus, believing upon him, you haven't, you're not justified by faith. You're hoping that you will be justified by just getting in and hopefully doing enough good. You, you might still be in that place of thinking humans can do it, can't we? No, we can't. We need the Saviour. Friend, if that's you, the invitation is clear. And it's a genuine invitation to come to Christ today and be saved. 
to receive salvation in the Lord Jesus. Don't put off till tomorrow what needs to be done today. Receive him today. Let's pray, friends. Father, we just thank you for this, this journey, this amazing look upon justification by faith. Lord, that you would look down upon humanity and see sin in abundance. Sin since Adam spreading to everybody, death reigning because of the sin. Nobody seeking after you by their own ability, all going their own way, all astray, and yet you send your son for us. Not that we would work for our salvation and earn it, but that we would believe and receive this grace that you have given to us. Father, I pray first and foremost for anybody in this room today who has not got peace with you through the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would stir them, that you would give them courage, courage to, to believe upon the Lord Jesus, that open their eyes and soften their heart, Lord, that they might receive this news today and come to you. And may we as a church expect that in our community, Lord. Expect that there is, there is changed hearts as a result of people hearing about the gospel. And Father, would you save those who are not yet saved. And Lord, for, for each one of us who are in Christ now, that we have life and not death, Father, may we just know this reality and rejoice in it. May it change us. May it transform us. May we be more like Christ as a result of it. May we be bolder in our proclamations of your word. May we, may we just have joyful hearts today as we look upon this reality, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.